Hi, welcome to the SIG Multicluster Intro and Deep Dive. I am Laura Lorenz and I work at Google. I'm Paul Mori. I'm Stephen Kitts. And I'm Jeremy Olmsted Thompson. I also work on GK at Google. So today we want to cover what the SIG is about. We especially want to highlight some of the next problem spaces that we're looking to take on. And we want to cover uh, details about our current activity. Um, so make sure everybody knows about some of our flagship projects, uh, some of our new projects that um, we've been recently working on and also give an update, uh, especially on some of the CAP style uh, content that we've been working on. And then we want to do a little bit of a deep dive. Uh, we want to talk about uh, conformance tests and gateway plus MCS in particular uh, to share about how those things all work together and how they could help you with um, interacting with some of the projects of the SIG. And finally, we want to share with how to contribute because we want to see you at SIG Multicluster. So what's this SIG about? It's primarily about figuring out collectively what the Kubernetes native way should be to handle a number of scenarios. So the first one is expose workloads from multiple clusters to each other so that multiple clusters can be joined and have uh, services, for example, use each other's uh, services. Uh, share multi-cluster data and where it lives, uh, well, where each cluster is compared to the others. And just in general, uh, break down walls between clusters. And this, of course, touches many different functional areas, um, but we don't really know this is an evolving space. So we're still working to figure out what the best and most durable primitives are, i.e. the best way to represent uh, all the objects that we need to care about. And since this is an evolving area, we want and we need actually your input uh, real user stories, so what you're trying to do, uh, the problems you're running into doing multi-cluster work um, or trying to trying to architect multi-cluster solutions, uh, deploy multi-cluster workloads, anything like that. We are keen to hear about it, so come and tell us what you're working on and we'll go over how you can do that at the end of the presentation. So how do we go about solving these problems? I think multi-cluster is this huge, basically endless space, and there's a lot of complexity that comes in stitching together clusters across different environments. So to make this a little bit more tangible and to prevent us from kind of getting stuck on these big, complicated ideas that maybe aren't uh, solving, uh, you know, tangible problems, we, we like to start with specific problems and work backwards into something bigger. So. Uh, you know, a good example uh, we'll talk about a little bit later here, multi-cluster services, where we start with, you know, connecting services together between clusters and just solving that one problem and then using that as a building block to figure out what's next. So we avoid premature standardization. We try to, you know, uh, focus on the APIs that, uh, that solve that specific problem and only define requirements that really need to be defined to solve the problem leave as much room for implementation as possible. Um, this is the avoiding optional problems. Uh, we, you know, if something isn't actually required as part of that core solution, uh, we wanna leave it open. We wanna leave it open for interpretation. We wanna uh, let various implementations, various platforms figure out how to solve it in their own way. Um, and one of our primary goals here is to keep multi-cluster consistent with single cluster wherever possible. I think the goal of this SIG is to make it easy to extend the same constructs you might use in a single cluster to this new multi-cluster world. So let's talk about our next problem spaces. Um, you're going to notice as we talk through these that uh, there, we've attempted to select work that's very focused on very specific problems, as Jeremy was saying. So for example, uh, on multi-cluster networking, we're looking for more sophistication now that we've done a little bit of the groundwork. So with regard to network policy, we want to look at applying policy uniformly across clusters. Um, we also want to look at stitching together clusters on different networks. Um, and I'm sure that probably resonates with 
um, anybody that has uh, you know attempted to make things work across clusters that are on you know like a uh, organically developed network topology, you might say. When it comes to multi-cluster controllers and multi-cluster leader election, we're looking for um, use cases and specifics that can inform the SIG about recommendations we can make or uh, work that we can use as a reference. In the area of the work API, we're looking at spreading groups of resources to different clusters. We also know that there's some interest in the areas of multi-cluster registries and control planes, but um, I wanted to make sure that we uh, made a note that these are very, very broad problem spaces, and they're also ones that have deceptively intuitive, naive use cases. In the past, when we've gotten into details, we really found that there was a lack of alignment on problems to solve and approaches to take to do so. So um, we're very interested in this one in particular in finding what the most essential problems there are to solve in these areas. Um, so let me let me provide a little bit of emphasis that like, if you're interested in these, we could really use some specifics to help guide and inform the discussion in the SIG. And finally, um, there's some work going on stateful set slices for migrating stateful sets between clusters. So hopefully it's coming across in the slide that we're interested in these really specific, tangible and concrete problems. All right. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the current activity of projects that we have going on right now in the SIG. So the first uh, topic to cover is one of the um, earlier established ones in the SIG. So if you've been to this presentation before, you may have uh, seen this a couple times, but to reiterate it for anybody who's new, um, one of the core concepts that SIG multi-cluster builds our solutions around is the idea of a cluster set. Uh, where a cluster set is a pattern of use that we have observed from the field and talking with people who are interested in multi-cluster deployments, where it's a group of clusters that are governed by a single authority. So interestingly, they have a high degree of trust within them, um, and this is a point that we can leverage to uh, build more standards on top of this unit. Um, and in particular, a property called namespace sameness applies to clusters in a cluster set. And what namespace sameness means in brief is that uh, within a given namespace, permissions and characteristics are consistent across clusters. So this will come up specifically later when we talk about multi-cluster services, where the principle of namespace sameness means a service of one name in the same namespace in cluster A should have the same characteristics as a service of the same namespace in cluster B they have namespace sameness. They're expressing similar characteristics within that namespace. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the same namespaces have to exist in every cluster or that the same workloads exist in every namespace or anything like that. It's just that if they do, then they should behave similarly. So that's the crux of namespace sameness. And uh, this cluster set membership, what cluster set a cluster belongs to is a really important property for our uh, solutions to build on top of. So one notable uh, tie-in to the next slide is that uh, what cluster set a cluster is a member of uh, should be stored cluster locally somewhere that the cluster knows so that any components can operate under uh, the knowledge of what cluster set they're in. And one of the projects of the SIG is to provide a uh, place to store that, the about.cates.io cluster property called clusterset.cates.io. So going to the next slide, let me uh, detail that a little bit more. So uh, since we're establishing all of this context around clusters like uh, cluster set membership um, that needs to be built on top of for, by multi-cluster tooling, uh, we saw a need for there to be a place to actually store that. Um, and we came up with the About API as a location to store 
technically any arbitrary cluster metadata, but there's a couple ones in particular that we think are important for the work that we're doing today. Um, this is written up in the form of a KEP. You can go see KEP 2149 for all the details. And it also uh, is available as a CRD that you can install from SIGS Kates.io slash about API. Um, but the idea here is that uh, this is a CRD that describes a cluster scoped uh, kind called cluster property that has a very simple schema, just the metadata.name and some value where a value can take on all sorts of different forms. Um, but the certain resources of certain names uh, might take a specific structure of value, but the CRD doesn't um, strictly say so in, in general. And two properties that we have uh, specifically laid out in that cap uh, are the two that are shown over here um, in this yellow box and in this blue box, uh, which are um, one to uniquely identify a cluster itself and also to identify its membership in the cluster set. So this one, cluster.clusterset.cates.io, the idea is that any resource in this uh, CRD of this name should contain the uh, a value that is an identifier for that cluster within this cluster set. And this property called clusterset.cates.io should always have a value that represents what cluster set that cluster is a part of so that we have these two pieces of information locally and easy to access in the CRD. Um, but generally the entire about API, uh, just including these two uh, specific resources described in the KEP, um, are to provide references for any sort of multi-cluster tooling to build on top of. And it can be, and it's explicitly in the KEP, that this is available as a well-known place to store these properties or any other properties that you might have for your other implementation of anything um, that might otherwise be have been implemented as ad hoc annotations on semantically adjacent objects. So this is kind of a little example. Um, you could have some other suffix here besides case.io for your cool implementation of whatever um, and store some other type of data that is relevant to the cluster as a whole or that you feel is better suited to be put inside the about API. And so the kind is still, you know, this schema, this name value schema is very flexible for whatever uh, people might want to do outside of the well known properties that we have described in the cap. So the next project I want to talk about is the multi cluster services API. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit in the prior slides as well, um, because uh, the concept of the cluster set and the utility of the about API um, in great part came from the discussions around how to solve MC multi-cluster services. So um, this is also in the form of a cap 1645 and the um, API and uh, some other reference uh, implementation and end tests and other types of tests we'll talk about later too, um, are available at sigskatesio slash MCS API. Um, but this is an API that describes the building block of how to expose a service from one cluster to another. So this was a very specific problem that the SIG wanted to address. Um, and uh, the way that uh, we did this was with this multi-cluster services API that describes what uh, is the behavior of a multi-cluster service. How can an API just describe that a service should be available in other clusters? If we do so, what changes need to occur for things that people already expect from services like DNS? How does multi-cluster DNS work compared to single cluster DNS? Um, and in the end, uh, what the what we were able to achieve here is to allow an API to um, express how a single service should span and be consumed by multiple clusters. Similar to the, uh, the approach slide we talked about earlier, it was really important for us on this project to focus on the API and the common behavior and leave a lot of room for implementations to actually fill out any details that weren't didn't need to be common to the standard. So um, there's several different implementations, uh, some of which you may have seen prior demos of from uh, this maintainer track or other talks. Um, 
and uh, each of them are able to vary in the implementation details, but still center around um, this API and the common behaviors that are laid out in this cap. Um, it was also important uh, for us that the uh, consumers, clusters uh, and workloads that are consuming a multi-cluster service only ever rely on local data. Um, so that ties in a little bit to some of our decisions regarding needing to provide, for example, the About API as a cluster scoped CRD that has local information about the cluster's metadata. And uh, the other important part is that uh, cluster IP and headless services work as expected, that there's some continuity with uh, the single cluster experience for these types of services, so that it feels really natural for people who are already used to the service API to use the multi-cluster services API. All right, let's talk about the SIG multi-cluster website. We want to give a major shout out to Nicola Pinto for all of his hard work on the website, which is at multicluster.sigs.cates.io. The website has higher level documentation for end users. It's got project status updates. Um, it's also got content to help connect implementers to our APIs and tooling and catalog implementations of the different APIs for end users. Thanks a lot, Nick. We really appreciate your help. All right, so I wanted to throw up a little bit of detailed information. I know there's a lot of words on this slide, but about some of those projects I talked about before that are built around a KEP. Um, they have specific graduation requirements that we've been steadily working on um, in the SIG uh, to um, graduate them to their next stage. Uh, in, through the CAP process. So just to give a little update to everybody who is here, the About API and the MCS API are two that are following this um, uh, graduation process. And uh, for uh, the About API, um, we're currently at a state where, and maybe by the time this uh, goes live, I guess, um, uh, actively working on or through, uh, the next stage of PRR approval and beta API review. So um, for this project in particular, since we're using the Kate's.io domain, uh, we undergo, we've already previously undergone an API review at the alpha stage. And so we'll do another round of that at the beta stage to move on to the next uh, step. And for the MCS API, I'm gonna skip the first one just for a second to talk about the last three, which um, it has a hard dependency on the about API. That's what this cluster ID cap is referring to. Um, so they're synced with each other. So one is depending on the other. Um, and then the MCS API, other uh, steps that we want to proceed with is the same uh, because it's a cap needs to go through this PRR approval process uh, as well. And for the, to get to the next stage, and also um, the MCS API uh, doesn't have the strict requirements for API review compared to about API, but it's still a voluntary step that we're interested in going through. And the last thing that the MCS API, the more um, content blocker as opposed to uh, procedure blocker is about the end-to-end -end tests. And I want to hand this over to Steven to talk a little bit about uh, the end-to-end -end tests for the MCS API and especially uh, some work that is going on to build beyond just the end-to-end -end tests and into something that is really valuable for implementers and end users to um, evaluate and um, improve the implementations of uh, the MCS API uh, through conformance tests. And uh, so major shout out to Steven, who's going to give you the update, and also Nick, who uh, worked a lot on these end-to-end -end tests as well. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. So Steven. Thank you, Laura. The uh, MCS project already has some end-to-end -end tests, but these sort of emerged uh, from developing the proof of concept implementation of the MCS controller. Uh, and so they have some, they're, well, they're fairly basic and they also have some uh, assumptions that aren't necessarily valid compared to the actual spec as it ended up being. However, it can, already be used as a sanity test of MCS implementations. So if you have a uh, your own MCS implementation, you can 
start two clusters, uh, join them uh, in whatever way is appropriate for your solution, and run the end-to-end -end tests using those two clusters, and you'll get a quick results telling you whether you match the end-to-end -end tests expectations or not. Um, but that's not really all that useful compared to the spec itself. So we started working on an actual conformance test suite. And the goal there isn't to test the implementation that we have in the MCS API repository. It's to provide a tool which can be used against any MCS implementation uh, to give you a report on how well that MCS implementation satisfies the specs uh, requirements and recommendations and suggestions. Um, it includes a well. It will include once we've finished uh, developing it, or you know, with your help if you want to get involved. Um, it will include tests that model realistic flows of um, data and connectivity uh, between clusters. Uh, it will also include references to the spec for any tests, not just the failing ones, really, but all the tests that are run uh, have pointers to the spec so that you can determine exactly which part of the spec is being tested. And when your implementation doesn't match what the spec says, you can go and check what the spec actually says um, and figure out whether, well, what, whether you should uh, fix your implementation or whether you should come and ask us to uh, change the spec, perhaps. Uh, and there are obviously a number of non-spec attributes that uh, can affect the result or that you might want to vary when you're running the conformance test suite. And so these are all configurable. This is things like uh, timeouts. Uh, for example, there's an expectation that you, when we create a, when we export a service in MCS, then eventually that service will be accessible across the cluster set, but that might take uh, more or less time depending on the implementation. So that can be varied. Also the number of clusters, uh, obviously you can, you might want to run tests against two clusters, three clusters more, uh, use this conformance test as a sort of scale test as well. Um, and you can even test some parts, use some parts of the conformance test suite with a single cluster, uh, because that does have some sense in the, uh, MCS spec. So that's pretty much all of the, the conformance tests. And uh, as I sort of alluded to, this is still being developed. Um, although by the time this video is shown, hopefully we'll have made some further progress, but I imagine there will still be work for interested people to join in the fun. So now I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Gateway API and MCS and, and how gateways extended the multi-cluster world. So first, a uh, big shout out to Rob Scott and other folks at Sig Network who have been driving us forward, um, you know, over the past couple of years now. Um, gateway, the Gateway APIs are really cool. They are, um, you know, a, a flexible uh, way to define gateways and figure out how services should be exposed beyond the cluster and build routes and, you know, basically uh, the service networking model and how that should apply to uh, to Kubernetes in a, in a more flexible, forward-looking way. Um, so for quite some time now, we've been talking about how uh, Gateway can apply uh, to multi-cluster services. In fact, this is something that we kicked around back in early alpha days for Gateway, um, and it's actually even supported already in some implementations, uh, like with GKE. Um, but uh, basically what we wanted to do is support uh, multi-cluster services uh, via, uh, via gateways, just like you would a service in a single cluster gateway implementation. And how we do this is we allow you to actually target um, service imports uh, with a gateway, just like that, that single cluster service. And now you can, the same way that the Gateway API lets you expose a service beyond a single cluster, you can use the Gateway API to expose a multi-cluster service beyond a cluster set. And this gives a lot of power. So first you can define, you know, these, these uh, uh, flexible uh, routes and rules. Um, uh, but really cool features are, for example, using, uh, using the Gateway API to do weighted uh, balancing and canarying traffic. Um, between multiple clusters or, or multiple instances of a service. Um, if you wanna do like a blue green service rollout, um, you can now do this in the multi-cluster world where uh, you know, those services may be spread across multiple clusters each, maybe in different clusters, make it really easy to kind of 
handle that, you know, old service, old cluster, new service, new cluster, uh, canary and, and rollout um, in a gradual way. And so there's a lot of power here introduced uh, uh, with the Gateway API. So again, big shout out to the folks at, uh, at SIG Network um, and also some other folks who've been involved with the SDO community. All right, so before we finish this presentation, how can you get involved? As we mentioned earlier, we need your input. We are very interested in hearing about your use cases, your problems, and your ideas. So come and share them with us um, at our meetings, which happen bi-weekly on Tuesdays, and you can see the times there on the slide. Of course, before you do that, you might want to find out more about us on the homepage, which we talked about earlier. You can come and talk to us as well. Uh, if you don't want to wait for a meeting or if you can't, if it's not convenient for you, join the Slack channel. Uh, we have conversations there any time of the day or night. And you can also send email, join the list uh, on the address that's given there. And if you join the list, you'll automatically get invitations to the biweekly calls. So they'll show up in your calendar and that will give you access to the meeting agenda and notes from previous meetings. Uh, and the Zoom link to actually come and join us. So we're looking forward to meeting you. Don't hesitate to come along. We're all very friendly. Thank you so much for coming to our presentation on TIG Multicluster, and we will see you at the Q&A. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.